taping this. Hi, and also welcome as well. So uh, good, good afternoon or uh, morning, whatever time zone you are in. Welcome to the uh, uh, webinar on uh, CBAM Global Town Hall 2022. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is on the record today, the discussion on the record. And we're here to uh, get into a discussion of the current uh, situation in the uh, or the progress that is being made in, in defining a CBAM and to the legislative process or so the kind of the state of the CBAM discussion in Brussels. But what is more important, because this is an international uh, global town hall, we are we're having people from around the world in joining us. We are having uh, we will look at the international reaction. What are the views from outside Europe? because the Europeans keep talking to each other, especially in the Brussels bubble. So it would be very, very interesting to see what is the reaction from outside Europe to some of the development in general, the direction where this is going. But also you'll hear today the fact that we had a vote in the Environment Committee or the EU Parliament yesterday, which kind of had a few people shaking their heads as a result of that. So it's going to be interesting to see the, uh, the outcome of, of that discussion. The, the discussion today is, pan, is, is divided into three portions. One of them is uh, an initial input from ERCST. So it's going to be Alexander Maratu, uh, Aaron Cosby, Mike Melling, and, and myself. We'll try, as I said, we'll try not to uh, hog the, uh, the, the whole time and, and, and go as, as reasonably quickly as we can, because what we want to listen to is the reactions on the NV committee from uh, from Sana Markkanen and, and Adolfo Aiello and Isabella Tobias. So uh, three speakers that will present different views. And then we switch to a roundtable discussion, which is much more, if you want, a global perspective to this and looking at the international reaction of the state of the CDAM discussion, issues around trade and climate change agreement, uh, we're focusing a little bit of discussion on, on one topic which we think is important. It has a strong resonance internationally, and that is the issue of circumvention. You will hear about it also in the, uh, uh, in the initial debate uh, in the, uh, about the outcomes in the NV committee. And uh, we have quite an interesting uh, present uh, audience here, a panel with Antonia Eliasson uh, from the University of Mississippi. Uh, Yuri Dadush, good to see Yuri, uh, from Bruegel and the Policy Center for the New South. Uh, I think that we have Makane Mbege from the University of Geneva, whom I'm not seeing right now unless he's not on the, uh, on the video, and Reinhard Quick from Zavlad University. Reinhard brings a wealth of uh, experience from the corporate policy and the intersection of corporate and policy world, and now in, the, in academia. So again, thank you all. I know that everybody is busy. You know, people like Adolfo have probably been snowed under last night at the receiving end, all kinds of votes and amendments in, in all kinds of committees. Uh, uh, so uh, I, again, we don't take for granted. We appreciate you taking the time. Uh, what I will do is I'll wait for one more minute and 15 of at least my what my clock says 1503 we wait for 1504 and then we get started and the way we get started with this we'll start with a, 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 a short presentation of what the way we detected the outcome on the vote on the entry committee just the highlights of what we see then and then a quick about circumvention and then some color commentary about climate change uh, agreement and inter an international trade agreement and how the CBAM is playing there. Again, we'll try and, and, be, and, and be swift. Uh, so Anita, if you're kind enough to, to put this on, I will think I have to do something, okay. So Anita, I think that if you want to put the presentation up, then I think Marina, uh, Marina Alexandra can start the presentation and away we go. So, uh, Alexandra, you start uh, with some discussion about the NV committee outcome. Uh, as I say, 
it is still work in progress. There may be a hitch here and there, but I think we got it right. Alexandra? Thank you, Andre. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, you've probably read uh, the news about the Environment Committee vote in the Parliament yesterday on the CBAM regulation, but I wanted to set the scene just with a brief overview so that we are all on the, the same page. Um, so in terms of, uh, well, the NV Committee has uh, basically proposed to increase the, um, the ambition of the regulation in terms of product scope and emission scope, as well as in terms of the timeline. So in terms of product scope, uh, if you go back one slide, um, uh, yeah, uh, it proposes uh, the inclusion of additional sectors from the outset of the mechanism, namely hydrogen, organic chemicals, and polymers. And then uh, it also proposes to include all EU ETS sectors by 2030. Um, then also from the outset of the mechanism, uh, the inclusion of uh, emissions related to electricity use uh, is proposed to be covered. Um, and then in the next slide, we can see also the ambition in terms of the timeline um, with uh, free allocation um, uh, for the covered sectors, the phase out of free allocation uh, to happen by, by 2030, uh, while for other covered EU ETS sectors, if they're included, uh, they will have four years to phase out uh, free allocation. Um, so in principle, if this goes through, that would mean no more free allocation in the US of 2035. Uh, in terms of trade flows coverage uh, on the imports are covered, um, but the Environment Committee uh, asks the European Commission to assess annually the CBAM effectiveness in addressing carbon, leak carbon leakage uh, associated with EU exports and, if necessary, propose uh, appropriate measures. Policy crediting uh, recognizes, uh, it's similar to the Commission proposal, uh, explicit foreign carbon pricing only, but it's just uh, more, uh, there is some language to clarify this. Um, then when it comes to how emissions, embedded emissions are, are calculated, we see an overall preference given to, to using actual emissions. Um, and then as a fallback, uh, in case these cannot be uh, uh, measured, there will be some default values and we see uh, an approach, a preference for an approach that would, um, would set values based on average intensities of worst performers, either in third countries or in the EU. Um, so this also applies to, to electricity. Now there is a preference for actual verified emissions for imports of electricity with defaults as fallback options. Um, in terms of uh, revenues use, uh, how, to, how to spend it, um, the Environment Committee uh, mentions that this would still uh, accrue as own resources to the EU budget, but uh, there would be uh, an equivalent amount spent in supporting uh, LDCs in their decarbonization efforts. Um, the governance of the system uh, would be uh, um, through a centralized uh, CBAM authority rather than uh, having a decentralized administration in the 27 member states. Um, the phase out of free allocation, as I mentioned before, is, is now more ambitious, uh, ambitious and it will be done by 2030 for the initially covered sectors. Um, next slide is, uh, well, finally, in relation to the topic that we want to focus later on today, uh, the Environment Committee has uh, defined what sort of instances could constitute circumvention. So you see here, uh, it's not maybe a, um, um, an exhaustive list, but they, they have defined uh, the following uh, six instances. Um, so it could be um, 
direct or indirect subsidies that could help um, the impacted uh, uh, exporters to absorb the costs of, of paying CBAM, or it could be a price on uh, a CO2 price placed uh, on goods exported to the EU, but only to the share exported. Uh, product modification that was also in the Commission proposal, and also trans transshipment um, and outsourcing of production of dungeon products with the objective of avoiding payments on CO2 price in the EU. And finally, uh, reorganization of um, um, of export of, of patterns by exporters uh, and channels of sales and production. Um, yeah, this is the overview and back to you, Andre. I hope it was not too fast, but um, yeah. Always interesting to, to, to listen to uh, Kisa Shon's uh, the organization likes to pattern a channel for cellar production with dual production cell practices. When I grew up, I grew up in a place where they had things for domestic production, domestic consumption for exports. Uh, interesting. Uh, let's move on now. And uh, if you want to, to start, Aaron, I think you start uh, giving uh, the initial couple of slides on, on, on circumvention. So, uh, Anita, let's move on. Thanks, Andre. So it's my pleasure to set the table for the discussion by talking a little bit about what, what we're talking about. What do we mean when we talk about circumvention of the CBAP? Um, broadly defined, we're talking about changes to trade patterns, to product characteristics, or to policies that have the intent of lowering compliance obligation for foreign producers without actually reducing the carbon intensity of their goods or increasing the carbon price to which they are subject. Um, we see some provisions in the Commission proposal for dealing with circumvention, but it's a very narrow approach focused mostly on um, modification, slight modification of, of products to get around the, uh, the regulations. In the, the Council general approach that was released in March, that was slightly expanded to include a focus on resource shuffling and splitting shipments. And of course, we saw in Alexandra's presentation that the proposal from the ENVI committee further expanded the lists of uh, uh, types of circumvention that uh, the, they want to deal with. If we could go to the next slide, it's useful to have a typology. What are we talking about when we talk about circumvention of the CBAM? The first item on this list has not been dealt with in the OMV uh, suggestions, resource shuffling. Here we're talking about low carbon goods, uh, a rearrangement of trade flows as opposed to actual production patterns, such that low carbon goods will flow to the uh, EU in this case, um, and high carbon goods will be uh, rerouted to other destinations, but there has been no actual change in production patterns and therefore no improvement in global uh, GHG emissions. Transshipment is fairly straightforward. Uh, that's a shipment of goods uh, that goes through exempted countries. Um, and in this case, that would be Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Iceland uh, that avoids CBAM obligations. Policy-related circumvention, here we're talking about uh, trade partners introducing a carbon price but failing to enf enforce it or finding some way to subsidize producers for the carbon price paid or only applying the carbon price to the exports and not to uh, the full line of production. Product modification, again, we heard about this in the uh, proposal from AV. Slight modification of products such that they fall just outside of the boundaries of the scope of the CBAM, the product boundaries of the CBAM. Splitting shipments, fairly straightforward, trying to fall under the de minimis requirements of the CBAM. And cost absorption, which was not mentioned in any of these, but which has been proposed by some uh, observers as a form of uh, circumvention. This being the subsidization by foreign producers of their export line to the EU by means of the uh, rest of their product line, which is not exported to the EU. In other words, uh, forcing them to subsidize the EU's uh, exported uh, section of production such that they lower the costs enough to uh, compensate for the fact that they have been charged a CBAM levy. I'll now pass it over to those that want to actually discuss circumvention. Well, I'm not sure I'll discuss circumvention. I think I'll discuss a, a, a tangent to circumvention because circumvention doesn't occur in a 
in a, in a vacuum it uh, uh, occurs or it's in the eye of the beholder depending on the of the framework that, that you look at and uh, i think that at least from my side uh, aaron is much more a wto person and more, a much more a framework convention person so looking at this i think that what we think is is it a legitimate reason uh, is it legitimately to call this wrong and I think that it depends on, it depends, it always depends on something on the objective of the CBAM. Now, what, what, and we've heard of the objective of the CBAM since the beginning of this debate that has moved, it's been a moving target. Sorry to say this, but it's true. But we started by saying that we want to ensure that the same price is paid for a ton of carbon of embedded carbon or that's produced in the EU or produced otherwise. If that is the case, then I would argue, one could argue, one could argue, that whether they pay it that at the border and exports or they pay it at the border in imports, it shouldn't make a difference because they, they are subject to a price of over 100 euros a ton or 80 euros a ton or whatever the, the, the cost may be. And the same thing will, will go down the line. So I'm not gonna go through each of them, but it's clear that there have been a number of, of reasons why this has been moved. Now you ask Aaron, you, you make the, the point that it's a producer of the product. So what are we trying to do? We want to make sure the product are, are, are there's no circumvention and the product itself is subject to the same price, or we try to change the producer in his behavior. Now, if that is the case, we can get into a long conversation, which is not a place here and now, maybe later today, about implications for international climate change agreements. Next, please. So is circumvention a problem? The answer is probably yes. And the reason for that is that it's, there are installation, there are whole companies which, and sectors that have high levels of exports. And there are installations that have a very high percentage of exports. It is the fact that European intensity is going down and it will continue to go down if we look at the target. So, minus 55 and God knows what else by 2030. And it is, so the, is, it, is it certain? Nothing is certain except death and taxes. But as they say in many other areas today, there's a high probability that this is gonna happen, that there is gonna be carbon leakage as a result of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of circumvention and exports. Next, please. Now, in, as a matter of principle, we look at the short shuttling and carbon price and exports only in this case, but we consider, again, this is jumping the gun a bit, CBDR and the Paris Agreement. What is the legitimate objective to level the playing field at the border for? Is the product level, Aaron's already spoken that, to prevent leakage of broader level, equalize carbon cost paid at the producer sector or country level. So in this case, resource shuffling is, is, it is, legitim is it legitimate to prevent a clean foreign producer from diverting clean, clean products towards the EU and its forcing CBAM? Can, it depends, it depends on the objectives of the CBAM. Carbon price on exports only the same answer. Is it legitimate to deny credit on export only carbon price? It depends. So I do believe that it is things that will come to play and they may come into play with as this thing becomes a reality and as we uh and as they you know people analyze it and decide whether they're going to challenge this or not next please and i'll pass it on to alexandra yes so this slide uh, is an example to illustrate the potential for resource shuffling uh, potential um we used the example of aluminium production in, in china and in the upper graph, you can see uh, uh, a graph a figure by Ember regarding the use of uh, different sources of electricity uh, in aluminium electrolysis in China in 2019. Uh, from it, you can see that 37 terawatt hours approximately of hydro generated electricity was used for the purpose versus 427 of coal uh, fire generation. Um, and based on these, uh, on this uh, figure, we estimated that hydro electricity accounted for about 2.5 million tons of aluminum production 
uh, in China. And then when we can compare this, this figure with, uh, with uh, figures in the lower table on the left-hand side concerning EU imports of aluminum uh, from China, um, which uh, when taking into account products in the current CBAM proposal in Annex 1 of the proposal, where uh, uh, amounted to about 0 0.6 million tons in 2019. So this is to illustrate that, yeah, uh, that there is a potential to, that the entire imports of aluminum products of the EU from China could be covered by hydro-based production with, uh, with zero scope two em emission intensity. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an example that can serve a bit for the for the discussion of uh, on questions that Andre raised in the previous slides. Uh, is it really a problem if if uh, Chinese hydro-based aluminum production is shifted shifted towards uh, exports to the EU? Well, I know what I know what the aluminum producer would say. Michael, you come to back right. next. Next slide, please. Thank you. So resource shuffling. Um, Aaron mentioned that it's not included in that non-exhaustive list of additional circumvention practices that Envy Committee had in its compromise amendment 10. But if you look in one of the proposed recitals, 46A, there it is listed as one of the things that um, should be prohibited. And as you know, we don't really have much border carbon adjustment experience and empirical data around the world. California has had one for almost a decade. And so it's useful to look into the Californian example because they had problems with resource shuffling. It imports about a third of its electricity from other neighboring states and including also from Canada and Mexico. And one concern was that if they implement, um, they, they have a border carbon adjustment that the suppliers of electricity would just shuffle, you know, start selling only the renewable electricity to California to avoid the California cap and trade system cost and keep the dirtier electricity. And initially California tried to suppress that by just having a prohibition in the rules. And here I bring us back to recital 46A pro proposed by the ENVY committee, which includes language to the, to the effect that all practices of circumvention should be prohibited. This raised alarm bells in the industry um, and also in the federal government back then in the US because they had to essentially attest under penalty of perjury that they would not engage in research shuffling was considered way too legally uncertain and risky. So then under pressure from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, California changed the rules and instead went to having a whitelist. We can go to the next slide, um, Anita. So defining in a whitelist, the 13 practices that were considered safe. Alas, those had to be relatively uncertain, not very specific, um, and gave a lot of um, discretion to, to the electricity suppliers. So the research done by various economists at Berkeley and also in a committee for, for the California Air Resources Board um, essentially calculated that this opens the door to research shuffling that far exceeds the expected mitigation of the California cap and trade system. And it was seen as a, a major sort of Achilles heel of um, the California border carbon adjustment for electricity. Let's go to the final slide where I want to say, sort of try to extract, what does that suggest for article 27 of the um, proposed regulation? So we heard before that the commission proposal is very narrow in what it sort of considers circumvention, really just product modification. The council added splitting of shipments and there's a lot of uncertainty. What would trigger a commission investigation, whether or not this is then really circumvention or there's a good excuse, a good explanation for these patterns. Obviously what the Environment Committee in the Parliament is proposing will expand and add a number of additional practices that would potentially trigger this. Still, you know, there are uncertainties in the definitions. There are uncertainties in what the commission, how it would react and whether it can meaningfully suppress activities such as resource shuffling. So I think you know, California just tells us it's very difficult and it's a cautionary tale. And I think this discussion is far from over. And back to you, Andre. Very well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I will stop the, uh, wherever, if I can find it, I will stop the sharing of the screen now. And back to, uh, to the panel. Uh, I think, Aaron, you may wanna talk a little bit about international trade agreement. A few words about that. Sure. So the um, uh, 
we we do have within the uh, CBAM as proposed by the the commission some elements that uh, might be in uh, contravention of WTO law. We know that that's an old debate. The the live question here is what elements of the circumvention debate are relevant for that topic. If we do, uh, let, let's focus for a moment on resource shuffling because the other forms of circumvention are straightforward attempts to cheat the system. Resource shuffling is not such an attempt, uh, neither, for example, is cost absorption. But let's focus on resource shuffling. Very quickly, uh, to, to pose the question, we know that the CBAM, in order to, it will probably be challenged uh, in WTO dispute settlement, and it will probably come down to a defense in Article 20, that is, for, for in non-technical terms, it will have to be defended, among other things, as an environmental measure, not as a measure that's designed to protect producers in the EU. If we have some sort of a, a prevention of resource shuffling, if, for example, the EU says that all those Chinese producers that Alexandra sh showed us that are currently manufacturing cleanly are not allowed to switch their production such that it comes to the EU and benefits from the presumptions of low GHG emissions under the CBAM, that doesn't sound very much like an environmental measure. Um, from an environmental perspective, it's a good thing that we have clean producers in the world and we reward them by means of lower penalties on their uh, incoming products. And so we do have a fundamental tension with WTO law. Uh, if we are seeking to reduce resource shuffling as defined, but as Michael said, it's hard to define resource shuffling. I'll leave it there because I know some of our panelists will have further comments on it and our time is short. Okay, very good. I will, I will dwell very quickly at being the devil's advocate in the UNFCCC debate. The NFCCC debate were currently the, the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement. If it's covered anywhere, it is covered under Article 415 of the Paris, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, but the, what I want to talk about first is that the fundamental building block of the Paris Agreement is NDCs, nationally determined contribution. By definition, they're nationally determined. And they determine nationally how we're going to do it and, and how much you're going to do. Now, just looking at uh, at what the uh, current discussion around the CBAM is, if I was to be a devil's advocate, I would argue that what you're doing is, if you don't have a a, a car visible carbon pricing mechanism, then you cannot get exemption. You can no matter what you do, you can do flip flop the cartwheels, but you will not get any credit for that. So all of a sudden, you're basically telling people that you have an NDC, and, but your NDC is not expressed in terms of a, uh, it doesn't have a, a carbon price in it, a visible carbon price in it, you're really out of luck. And the, same, the second piece of it is the level. Now, if you have a, uh, if you don't, if you, the price in the EU is 100 and your price is, is 20 in India, whether in India 20 is more than 100 in Europe, that's, that's a debatable thing, level of effort and so on. But nevertheless, unless you have also 100 euros a ton, then all of a sudden, yes, you're gonna pay your 80 euro penalty. So these, if you, if you are looking at it from the point of view of the framework of which and the Paris Agreement, I think that it could certainly raise question now. Is there a desire in the framework convention negotiation under the Paris Agreement to create problems with that and raise it? So far, it has been muted. So far, it has been tangential. People are aware of it. The people behind the flag know about it, but they are raising it and then moving on to point B. How this is going to play when this become a reality is not something that's in my hands and that we'll, we'll see. But nevertheless, these are some of the things to be interesting to hear uh, from others who, what they uh, what they hear. But also, you know, there are also not only the national uh, objective of the Paris Agreement, but also the global objective of the Paris Agreement of the 1.5 carbon neutrality by the second half of the century. Also, something that needs to be taken into account in discussion. We stop here. I think we 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 went a little bit. We we we, we saved seven minutes on the clock. And we'll go to, to Sana Markkanen first. Uh, Sana, would you uh, get your reaction, initial reaction to some of the discussion on the what is happening in the EU? 
And uh, we looked at, at uh, Alexandra's table with looks on, on, on one side, the, e, the commission's proposal. On the second, on the other side is the uh, came out, what came out of the envy committee. We do remember, remind ourselves the envy is a committee. It is still has to go to the plenary uh, of the European Parliament sometime in, in June. Sana? Um, thanks, Andre. And um, apologies if I lose my internet connection. Um, I seem to be experiencing some problems. Um, so, I mean, just to pick up on um, what was interesting about the MV committee's vote, um, I think it was overall um, fairly positive from an environmental point of view. Um, however, there is the big question over the phasing out of the ETS free um, allowances or free allocation. And um, it was not um, the vote today, um, sorry, yesterday was not um, as ambitious from that point of view as uh, Mr. Shahim's original proposal was. However, it is still technically uh, more ambitious than uh, what the commission put forward. Um, there is a, um, an interesting difference in uh, what the MV committee was proposed today in comparison, um, sorry, agreed on uh, yesterday, in comparison to um, what the commission proposed originally. Um, and that is how quickly the free allowances would be phased out. So the final deadline for phasing out of free allowances is sooner in the ENVY committee's um, current agreement um, than it would have been um, in the commission's uh, initial proposal. However, the process starts a lot later and it is a lot slower um, from that point of view. So you don't reduce by 10% per annum, uh, you start reducing from 2028 and then you face them out entirely over a two year period. So um, there are questions to be asked as to whether this is actually a feasible proposal that will um, be successful in the plenary. Um, I personally, would expect there to be quite a lot of opposition to it. So if we look at all the different committees within the European Parliament who have uh, put forward their proposed amendments um, and who have voted on them, um, there is still several points remaining um, that have not um, been agreed upon and where the positions seem to be quite diverging from one another. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the plenary. Um, I think we might end up with a um, European Parliament position that we can't quite visual, visualize at the moment. Thank you, uh, Sana. Um, Adolfo? Yes, thank you, Andre, and thanks for inviting me to this um, event in this busy day. Um, well, my comment actually uh, to the MV vote, I will borrow the words from, uh, from uh, one of our member companies. And uh, the person used the following words, it's a life-threatening result, uh, and it's not a life-threatening result for the status quo of the steel industry, but for the transition to green steel in Europe. Uh, the company that was speaking and was using these words is a company that um, has a, a couple of billion project investment. Uh, this project has been uh, discussed for the Innovation Fund. It has been discussed for the IPCI uh, Green Hydrogen. Uh, uh, none of them uh, was awarded in spite of the huge quality of the project. It's a project that can cost to the company between one and two billion euros. Uh, nothing like this has been spent by any company in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years, uh, uh, years in Europe. And with this result, this company will have still to make that investment. And on top of that, uh, the company could uh, have to pay something like seven, 800 million euros a year in uh, allowances uh, in the years 27, 28, 2030. So um, 
it is not a secret that the steel sector has been uh, um, a supporter of the CBAM under some clear conditions. Uh, the first one was a, a smart and cautious transition between the current system and the new one. Just to explain the complexity and the ambition of the CBAM, with today's free allocation, the CBAM would have to um, somehow compensate for primary steel around 30 to 40 euros per ton. Without free allocation, you need to recover through the CBAM around 200 euros per ton of steel. So if you have the tiniest problem uh, with the CBAM, you are basically affecting the whole viability of a European company. And this company, and this is also what is uh, very often forgotten, is that European companies will have to pay these 200 euros for their entire production. Uh, an importer into the EU can decide, and this is usually the case, they export to the EU on average less than 5% of their production. So even if you have to pay the same 200 euros per ton, the fact that you pay only on 5% of your production leads to a completely different impact on your business case. So this is on the phase out. Uh, on the exports, uh, unfortunately, we have seen uh, um, close to empty words in the final text. Uh, MV is asking the Commission an impact assessment of the CBAM on exports and the proposal. Well, this is a bit uh, inconsistent because the CBAM proposal has nothing on exports. So what can you impact assess on exports if there is no uh, solution for export in the document? And secondly, why asking another impact assessment if already this one, accompanying this proposal has shown very high impact on exports, even with a much lower carbon price than what we are seeing today and what we are um, expecting by 2030. So these are two crucial points. The same goes with the scope to uh, emissions. Um, MV committee opted for a faster inclusion of scope two. Again, also there, as you have uh, explained and shown the risk of aluminum in steel, we have also electric arc furnaces recycling steel. Uh, this is the second uh, more electrointensive process after aluminum. So this is definitely gonna be um, exposed to uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of risks. Uh, when it comes to um, say convention, resource shuffling and so on, we have seen also there are some attempt to improve, but the experience of the steel sector in trade defense would really, really recommend a much more cautious approach on the CBAM introduction and the transition. Um, a few years ago, uh, probably, uh, you know, Climate people not familiar with trade policy do not know these details, but in 2015, there was a first wave of dumped imports of steel to Europe. Among those, it was China, the primary issue. With some months of delay, the European Commission intervened with, uh, with some uh, duties. And three years later, Indonesia, thanks to Chinese investments, became the uh, biggest uh, stainless steel producer um, uh, after China uh, and before the EU. So what I'm saying is, it's extremely challenging to anticipate how the business will react in third countries to these kind of measures. And that's why we uh, remain convinced that a much more cautious implementation is uh, safer for us, is safer for the downstream sectors, what is also usually forgotten is that this very fast transition proposed will also affect much more um, the downstream prices, uh, material prices, and so on. So uh, as you can imagine, we will work along these priorities um, in view of the plenary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Adolfo. Isabella Tobias, uh, if I, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Isabella, from yes. the Polish uh, Climate Change Agency. Isabella. Thank you for inviting me to this discussion. And I would like to share our opinion uh, Kubiza Cake about the implementation of the CBAM. As we know, EU's Environment Committee passed several amendments to the proposed CBAM, especially with regard uh, to the phase out of free allowances concluding uh, 2030 rather than in 2035. However, from our perspective, the pre preferred option is to postpone this decision on the phase out of free allowances 
until the first comprehensive assessment of the functioning of the CBAM and to demonstrate that uh, the system is able to prevent carbon leakage. At the same time, uh, the start date uh, for the phase out of free allowances cannot be earlier than 2030. It should be noted that the solution uh, to phase out free allowances could even undermine the competitiveness of European industry, as well as negatively affect uh, national economies, the elimination of free allocation, therefore the need to purchase uh, more emission allowances by companies in the EU will directly increase production cost and uh, weaken export potential due to price uh, competitiveness of European products. This is also determined by the situation in which uh, the industry was found uh, due to the Russian attack on Ukraine. And the CBAM sectors are already facing huge costs uh, associated with the prices of energy carriers, which may increase further with EU sanctions. In this uh, context, it's not justified to impose additional burden on the European industry. Another crucial point from our perspective is transition period ending in 2024. The presentation of the report uh, is too early to correctly assess the impact of the introduction of the CBAM. And we believe that the period of uh, maybe five years after the entry into force of the new rules uh, should be assessed. This will allow to appropriate assess uh, the functioning of this tool. And on the basis uh, of this review, it will be possible uh, to decide on further steps in the operation of the CBAM and free allocation. The pilot phase, which aims to identify possible shortcomings and also the effectiveness of the tool should cover entire administrative uh, process with the mandatory purchase of certificates by the importers. Therefore, the pilot phase should primarily be used to verify the effectiveness of the CBAM tool. Like, does the CBAM implement its uh, primary objective to prevent uh, carbon leakage in the EU? Uh, the possibility of extending CBAM to other goods, uh, including indirect emission and the uh, CBAM to the management uh, system itself. Therefore, should it be uh, it should be it should be not a top uh, priority, and a positive uh, review of the CBAM tool after the transition period is an indication of uh, continuation and uh, and extension. Well, uh, with regard to climate support for developing countries, uh, we believe that CBAM uh, should be primarily an instrument to encourage developing countries to make appropriate efforts in the field of climate protection and the creation of an instrument directly compensating uh, developing countries uh, for the creation of the CBAN will reduce the effect of the mechanism. Well, in conclusion, we need to reach, uh, of course, a compromise of the subject as we want to achieve uh, the climate objective, but uh, we don't want the industrialization of Europe. That's all for me for now, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'm encouraging people to raise their hands and, and raise issues or, or comments, uh, hopefully more, uh, some, maybe some questions to, uh, to the panelists, but also issues they want. First, Nick Bitsios from, uh, I'm not sure which hat you're wearing, is it Business Europe or your own company, every company, uh, aluminum company, uh, Nick, or both? Thanks, Andre. I'm very much wearing my aluminum uh, company hat today. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the aluminum issue is one that has come up already a few times during this discussion. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about how we as the aluminum sector see the issue of the convention, the risks involved. And the main message that I would like to leave with you today is that if we end up including the indirect emissions in the CBAM, you massively increase the possibilities for circumvention. And there are a few reasons why I say this. 
the first one is that it's often very difficult to actually prove the indirect emissions that are related to a consumption in a third country. Now we have a good idea of what the carbon footprint of the grid in each country is, but what matters in the context of the CBAM is individual consumers, individual installations, and the supply that they have. And often they can be very different to the supply of the grid. I think an obvious example of this would be the case of a, a PPA that could be signed with a specific power source that could be a, a coal plant or a rest plant or uh, anything in between. And unfortunately, this information is not public. It's a matter of the, the contracts that the consumer has signed. And once you start getting into this, um, you know, asking basically the, the consumer to open up his contract in the, the case of a potential dispute about the um, declarations that are being made, then I think it's, um, it's clear that you end up with a massive case for, for circumvention. Now, in other cases, uh, and I'll come now to the case of China that was mentioned uh, before, it is easier to prove what the, the indirect emissions are. So as we mentioned before, in the case of China, you have uh, quite a few aluminum smelters with captive power plants. So that's the case where the smelter has a direct line to the power generating source, could be a coal plant, could be a rest plant. Uh, they have a lot of um, hydro in, in, um, in China. Um, I'll get, get to the end of it, Andre. Um, and in this case, it's obviously clear to, um, to prove what the indirect emissions are. Now, in this case, so the, the, the challenge is down the, the value chain, where the, the semi-finished, but the, the, the producers of the downstream products will try to prove, they'll claim that they bought the aluminium from a hydropowered plant. So my question would be, it's not so much whether we have a problem with the hydro aluminium being sent to Europe. That should indeed have a, uh, a zero uh, CBAM charge. The problem is if you have the coal-fired aluminium coming into Europe being masqueraded as clean aluminium producing hydropower. That's very, very dis difficult to disprove, and that's the main message I would like to um, leave with you today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, uh, Nick. Uh, Sana, you raised something in your uh, in, in the chat, but I, you know, prefer to to raise it live because this is uh, the, the whole packages that were discussed yesterday, and the, this is the the twin brother or sister of the ETS, and 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 there are provisions in the ETS that overlap. And sometimes are uh, are maybe in contradiction. So, uh, Sana, I give you the floor to make your point. Um, thanks, Andre. So, um, obviously, um, as um, we have all touched upon, the phasing out of the free allowances, which is the most obvious connection to the EU ETS. Um, but we have also kind of discussed about. Um, the Envy Committee's proposal to include scope two emissions as soon as possible. Now, there, there are several reasons why many um, industrial operators um, oppose this, um, several of them for a very good reason. Um, and one of them is that the cost of electricity in Europe in particular, but especially some specific countries within Europe is extremely high at the moment. And if we simply extend the scope of CBAM to cover um, scope two emissions, um, it is well possible that even um, dirty fuels um, that are being used in many other countries would accrue a lower CBAM tariff than the actual cost of electricity that is being charged to large scale users in, in the EU. Um, and that can create a problem because it doesn't actually level the playing field um, because there are so many environmental levies and there are other reasons why electricity cost in Europe is high. And this links to the ETS vote on indirect cost compensation, which is directly relevant to the potential extension of the CBAM to scope two emissions. Um, and the indirect cost compensation is something that is much less talked about, but it's extremely important that we bring this into the conversation about CBAM, especially if we are looking at a situation where um, the, um, the European Parliament will end up with an overall view that we should extend um, CBAM to scope to emissions. Um, this is particularly relevant for green steel, um, as in uh, recycled steel using electric arc furnishes. 
but also for aluminium industry. And um, with the proposal to also extend the CBAM to various other sectors immediately and to all ETS sectors as soon as possible, um, I think that's an aspect that would be uh, would warrant further investigation to understand just how closely uh, the inclusion of scope two emissions uh, would compensate for um, industries that, that use electricity within Europe. And I think this is, Nick, probably quite related to the comments that you were making, particularly reference to aluminium industry. Okay, uh, well, look, let me, uh, let me do one thing because I've been encouraging people to raise their hands, but they're, they're, they're resisting. I think the, uh, this, this, this virtual setup is not conducive always to active discussion, uh, but I'm shouting in, you know, in, in the wind. Uh, let me ask the, the, my two colleagues or my three colleagues uh, and also the, the three panelists, Sana, Adolfo and Isabella, if you were to take this package, this is a surprise. If you were to take this package and look at it, uh, you know, like you would give it a qualifier. Everybody gives a pack something a qualifier. Do you think it's reasonable? Do you think it's over the top? Do you think that this is out of the ballpark? What is it? I mean, how would you qualify this 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 thing? I'll tell you how I'll qualify it. I'll qualify it as wow. That's how I would qualify it. Now, how you know who wants to start? I, I, it's a challenge. It, it, I'm prepared. It, it's something that just came to mind now. I don't know. That I, I'm it. happy to jump in as I always and have. And I hear the music right. in the background. It's yeah, like yeah. a pink panther. Go ahead. <laughs> Listen, there are aspects of. Uh, for me, the original commission proposal did a good job of balancing between the need for ambition and pragmatism. So uh, the, the long timelines, the lack of broad sectoral inclus inclusion responded to the, the fact that we don't have a handle yet on how to prevent circumvention, that we don't have a handle on how to prevent leakage, and that we don't really know how to deal with scope two emissions, that is emissions from electricity, uh, without, without screwing up the whole system. Um, and in, in light of the EU's uh, electricity pricing methods and the deficiencies in the mechanism for indirect cost compensation. I thought it struck a good balance. I don't think the Avi committee recommendations do that. Uh, 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 the, the, the point of the balance was, was partly because we, we don't know how to deal with those things, but it was also because this gives the, you know, the longer timeline gives us time for the EU to make investments in decarbonization, to decarbonize its electricity grid to the point where leakage is not so much of a problem. And frankly, to let the rest of the world try to catch up. Um, the short timeline, the broad sectoral inclusion, the inclusion of scope two emissions, all of these, I think, are laudable in terms of ambition, but mistaken in terms of their final impact. Uh, I don't know who wants to come next. Um, I'm happy to come in next. Um, so, I mean, if, if we look at the conversation around CBAM and uh, that has taken place since the 14th of July, and uh, there's really been, I'd say, five issues that have been frequently um, brought to the fore of that conversation and uh, some of them way more important and way more impactful than others so there's been the question about the scope which sectors should be included um, should we include manufacturing uh, should we include scope two emissions um, second how should we treat developing countries should they be exempt um, should some of the revenue be uh, recycled to support climate action in developing countries or in the least developed countries. Um, and this links to circumvention. Obviously, if least developed countries were exempt, um, then it would be um, 
it, it would provide yet another avenue for potential circumvention. Um, the third one is the phase out of free allowances. And we've had many different proposals from uh, European Commission originally, then European Council, um, and then various different committees within the European Parliament. Um, and this seems to be an issue that there is just absolutely no consensus. But at the same time, it is hugely important. Um, there is a question about should we include regulation? as grounds for a lower CBAM rate, or should we not? Again, there is diverse pr perspectives on this within the European Parliament committees. Uh, and then there is the question over the treatment of exports. Um, and it was the question on the scope that the Envy Committee's um, recent agreement really addressed a very strong argument for extending the scope, extending it to scope two emissions, various different sectors and so on. Um, it's ambitious. Um, it remains to be seen whether it would even be doable. Um, how to treat developing countries. Again, there was a clear message being sent, although with very little detail or clarification as to what it actually would mean in practice. And what we need to remember is that the expected CBAM revenue is actually going to be a tiny drop of money in the ocean. It's not going to be a huge amount of money. Um, and perhaps there are other budgets from where we should more effectively be supporting climate action in least developed countries. Um, inclusion of regulatory policies. Envy is very clear on this. They don't want regulatory policies to be grounds for exemption. And the treatment of exports remains to be seen, and I will finish there. What I wanted, I, I actually, I expressed myself in the wrong way, but what, what I meant was, what's your reaction? Like, what's your first reaction? You did say this, you know, I, I said, I, my reaction was, wow. I, you know, I was looking for a gut reaction. How do you qualify this stuff in, in five words or less? And also, I, just, I think, is it is it public? It, can it be said in public or? Exactly, that was my question. <laughs> the reaction that can be mentioned in a public event or not? Um, no, I think it's uh, it's not too far from what uh, Aaron said. Um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it is too fast, too much, too big, and one should also, if we, uh, I know Andrew, uh, Andrew, you like uh, frank uh, statements and uh, questions, and you don't avoid them. One should also wonder if some of those proposing uh, for such a CBAM uh, are really believing in the CBAM or they are rather not believing in the carbon leakage risk. Because you have been long uh, in the ETS and you have heard from uh, many years some uh, policymakers and some stakeholders not really believing in the, in the carbon leakage risk. And of course, if you do not believe in a carbon leakage risk, then any CBAM is even too much. So uh, I know that you like this kind of uh, provocative questions, so uh, you, you might want the, uh, the answer. We specialize in provocative. Uh, I've got two candidates left, uh, or uh, three, uh, so, but who wants to be, let's try and be short. Michael, I think you, you switched uh, on. Yeah, yeah, I did switch on. Let's get it over with. Um, <clears throat> I can't use the language I would, but if I were another country, and I'm thinking of the country I'm sitting in right now, the US, the expansion of the scope and the acceleration of the timeline changed this thing entirely. No, it really changes it entirely. Chemicals will be included. Many other products where the US actually import, uh, exports to the EU in meaningful numbers. And this will affect other countries too. So the mouse that roars is starting to roar very loudly as we called it earlier. Uh, the mouse that roars because it is really sort of this signaling effect, this political effect that has shown to have an impact um, in, in many trade partners. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I remember we called this at the beginning, first time we did this, we called the mouse that may roar. Uh, I've got two candidates left, uh, Isabella or Alexandra. Alexandra, I'm terrorizing. Oh, I can go ahead. Now. Yeah, I mean, I agree that it's, it's very ambitious, uh, especially the, the product scope uh, extension. And yeah, you include uh, sectors like chemicals, you include hundreds of, of, of products, uh, and it's a very challenging 
technically very char challenging to, 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 to administer uh, and to calculate emissions of, of such products, let alone if you cover all EU ETS sectors. So I don't know, the a question is, is it, yeah, is it a realistic proposal or is it a, a negotiation position in the environment committee knowing that further down the road it will probably be reduced in ambition in the plenary and then in maybe in the negotiations with the council so that's that's a bit uh, the question thanks alexander isabella yes i i agree with other panelists uh, we should focus uh, maybe more on the gradual uh, introduction of this mechanism in order to be able to examine its effect and uh, find uh, find the balance and uh, look at this uh, mechanism as one of element of all the fit for 55 package otherwise uh, the increase in the cost of uh, energy carriers and also of price of allowances uh, may be too high and uh, it could uh, cause some social problems you know you wanted the floor but i will ask you to react to what's your what is your reaction from setic to this and that's not because we need to I think there's a, there's a huge demand to listen to, 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 the, to the panelists that are patiently waiting and I'm very anxious to hear them as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, I'm really actually eager to listen to Reinhard quick um, um, about his view on where we are going. My personal view is that this um, NV committee extension of the scope and the lack of a uh, solution for exports is um, in my view, a guarantee that uh, the ET uh, that the CBAM uh, will not fly a uh, short term, because that is a key request from the Council, as we all know, and um, we are seeing a lot of um, a lot of complications um, as a result of the NV vote. So um, I think what they, the the NV has not done itself a, a very good service in in adding uh, ambition, adding, um, adding uh, shortening the, the phase, uh, phase out period of reallocation and so on. So it's really getting further and further away from where, where some MEPs want this to go. Thank you. Thank you, folks, I appreciate it. Let's move on to kind of international reaction or a more international view, if you want, I mean, uh, there were Everybody here has coming from a different uh, walk of life in a different sector and different country. But I want to start with Antonia, who is in, in Mississippi. What do you, what's, what, I, I don't know that I can say what's the reaction in Mississippi, but what is your perceived reaction in the United States? So thank you. Um, I mean, a few things I want to mention right at the beginning. Um, I think it's important to note something that we all know that <clears throat> what whenever we try to take climate change measures, there's going to be constituents both inside and outside of the country that want to find ways of making that initiative less possible. Um, a lot of that has to do with profit motivations, fiduciary duties to shareholders. And we've been talking about the product scope expansion, which definitely raises some really significant concerns, especially when we look at it from the United States and see how many years it took the ETS to actually start working and how many revisions of the ETS were necessary. So there are some genuine concerns. But that said, I think, you know, there are two different camps on this, but for those who are really concerned about climate change, um, there's a recognition that certain parties will experience hardship, right? Some companies are going to suffer. Some goods are going to become more expensive, which is going to hurt consumers as well as manufacturers. And some parties are going to take advantage of the system to try to bypass the measures. So even in the most optimistic prognosis where we don't need economic degrowth, um, there are significant costs that are associated with moving to lower carbon emissions. And what the EU has proposed is ambitious, right? In a vacuum without any other country implementing similar measures, there is going to be more room to manipulate and circumvent CBAM. But I think the answer can't be to do nothing. And for a lot of people, the answer has been to do nothing for so long. And I'm reminded of an article that I recently read about the frustration that the younger generation, we're talking Gen Z or even younger kids in high school, are experiencing with respect to climate change. 
And we've known what the solution to climate change is for years, but globally politicians and corporations have refused to do anything concrete. And so for the younger generation, there's this frustration and hopelessness that lies in knowing that this is the largest crisis we've faced as a planet, knowing what the solutions are, but watching year after year with nothing happening. And so you see critics of CBAM call it suboptimal. And I think as a planet, you can't wait for optimal, right? We've been waiting for optimal. That's not an answer. Um, from a developing country perspective, I think you know the proposed amendments to provide additional support to least developing countries is important. It recognizes that the financial uh, gains can't just go to the EU's budget. And when we talk about combating climate change, access to justice is such a key component. And it's one that CBAM has drafted somewhat overlooked. So in a way you're getting, uh, you're both angering the corporate interests, but you're also not really uh, giving anything to the people who are interested in just transitions. So switching to low carbon emissions, right? We know it's really costly. And without support, CBAM kind of risks keeping developing countries from developing manufacturing and industrial sectors. And we've seen this before. There's a lesson to be learned. If you look at the novel special and differential treatment measures in the trade facilitation agreement, there were these measures put in this WTO agreement designed to help capacity building in developing countries on the part of donor countries from the developed countries. But there's no accountability mechanism. So the end result is that the accountability has largely fallen on developing countries to implement um, the trade facilitation agreement, and something similar is likely to occur with, with CBAM. Um, I'd want to mention on the circumvention uh, problem of resource shuffling that Aaron brought up uh, in the context of WTO rules that, um, as Aaron said, right, like this is a fundamental tension with WTO law. If a country wants to sell low carbon products to the EU and offload the high carbon products to other countries, that's really up to them, at least from a trade rule perspective. And that goes beyond production methods. Um, even when we look at the discussion between product related PPMs and non product related PPMs in the context of labeling regimes, which CBAM is obviously not we're still talking about characteristics of the specific products in question. So think about the US tuna two dispute. We were looking at how the tuna were caught in a way that didn't harm dolphins, but you can't extrapolate that to CBAM because if the products being exported to the EU meet the requirements of CBAM, that satisfies the general understanding of how this works in the context of WTO dispute settlement. Um, you could possibly make an Article 20A public morals argument that this conflicts with public morals based on maybe the EC Seals case. But if the goods that you're importing satisfy the carbon levels that you're looking for, or if taxes are imposed uh, to offset higher carbon emissions, which is what CBAM does, 20A falls flat. Um, if it's really a matter for public morals, then you don't want to have any products, irrespective of taxes imposed, produced with higher carbon emissions. And the same would go for a 20B or a 20G argument. Um, but I think, you know, we've seen the U.S. talking about implementing something like CBAM, which for anyone who, who deals with trade rules makes you want to bang your head into a wall repeatedly, right? Because the U.S. says, oh, CBAM sounds great. Let's implement CBAM without taking into account that without an ETS equivalent, you're just violating trade rules. So the entire, all the U.S. proposals so far have reflected I think a very unserious approach to bringing something like CBAM forward. You propose something in Congress, but it's not, it's, it doesn't have any teeth to it. It hasn't been thought out. It doesn't recognize that you can't just impose basically taxes on imports of goods. Um, the reality is you can't combat climate change without impacting international trade, right? From manufacturing processes to the transport of goods, emissions and trade go hand in hand. And if, as we've been talking about a little bit, you have to justify climate measures under the Article 20 general exceptions, then you are acknowledging that they violate trade rules. And that suggests a hierarchy of norms in which trade liberalization is more important than mitigating climate change. And that means that however we view trade, and especially as we see the WTO arguably marginalized, 
the basic system of trade rules that we currently have may clash with these efforts to mitigate climate change. And honestly, that's not good enough. So um, for most of the non-EU countries like the US, it's not enough to tackle imports. Right now in the US at least, it's just political rhetoric. I think there's, there's very little effort to actually do something. And I think finally, my last point on circumvention, going back to that, some degree of circumvention may be inevitable, at least until big global economies adopt measures to combat high carbon emissions and imported goods. And in that sense, maybe perfect is the enemy of good. Thank you, Anthony. I think that my, my good friend Aaron is going to have to reflect on some of these, these clashes between climate change and, 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 and in WTO because he, he holds WTO in high esteem. And I, I claim that I claim that, that, that currently climate change is going to beat WTO, but we shall see, Aaron. I mean, listen, this is a very interesting conversation, and I think we're all smiling because we've had this discussion many times late in the evenings. Next is Uri Dadush. You are on mute, Uri. Yes, yes. Uh, so, um, I'm also based in the US, in Washington. I look at this a little bit from far away as a trade economist and as a development economist. Um, and my view is that uh, the CBAM itself is well-intentioned, of course, but uh, uh, it is unlikely to meet its objectives and is instead likely to have very serious unintended consequences. Uh, the theory of carbon leakage finds little or no confirmation in the literature, whether you look at it from a company point of view, of course, it will have some effect. Uh, you know, carbon taxes have some effect on, on profitability at the margin. But uh, location decisions by firms are based on many factors of which even if you have a high carbon price, uh, carbon price is a, is a small part and uh, uh, the other aspect of carbon leakage, which is, uh, 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 you know, uh, countries, uh, countries doing more uh, carbon intensive activities because the EU consumes less. Uh, that doesn't work either. And I think uh, we've had a confirmation of that in the discussion and the speaker that just proceeded. Um, the second point is that the uh, incentive effect on trading partners, uh, which is another objective of the CBAM, is very unlikely to change the complex political dynamics uh, behind decarbonization, especially in large countries such as the US, uh, China, and India. Uh, this would be true even if the carbon tax was huge. Uh, but uh, in the case of, for example, the large countries, US, China, and India, exports of covered products to the EU account for a tiny part of exports and of uh, GDP. Um, and also in a, in a paper I wrote a while back, I tried to look at what was happening to carbon emissions in the countries that were uh, exporting covered products, uh, the covered products in the previous proposal. And uh, uh, I saw that the carbon emissions of the countries uh, that are exporting a lot of covered products to the EU are actually, have actually been declining at about the same rate as that of the EU, even without the CBAM. Um, the CBAM of course is inconsistent with the Paris Agreement. Uh, with differentiated responsibilities, since it assumes one carbon price instead of a differentiated one, as proposed, for example, by the International Monetary Fund. And the fact that there is no provision in the initial proposal at law, at least, for reallocating CBAM revenues to developing countries uh, makes, the, uh, makes the proposal even more inconsistent with the Paris Agreement. The CBAM without any question will be challenged at the WTO uh, 
and it will be challenged in many ways. Uh, first, because as is evident in the discussion on evasion, um, which, which uh, we have heard. First, because the computation of carbon content is Im immensely complex. Um, second, because other countries are free to adopt different schemes in the absence of a global agreement, which may also include, by the way, schemes that cover exports. Um, third, because the coverage of the CBAM as currently proposed is selective. It does not, for example, cover agriculture, which is the biggest emitting sector and which the EU subsidizes heavily. And so will be interpreted correctly as a discriminatory measure because of its selectivity. And of course, if as expected, the EU fails to phase out carbon allowances rapidly, it will be accused quite correctly of pure protectionism. So to achieve its decarbonization targets, instead of uh, the CBAM proposal, the EU should consider alternatives, such as an international agreement on differentiated carbon prices. And if that is too difficult, which I acknowledge it will be very difficult to do, uh, for many reasons. Then instead of the CBAM and indeed the ETS approach, a wiser course would be taxes on consumption of products that are carbon intensive and that apply indiscriminately to domestic and foreign production or regulations that ban the use of some products and of certain production methods that are heavily carbon intensive Again, these measures would apply indiscriminately to imports as to home production. And th these kinds of measures would be simpler to apply and less discriminatory. But of course, politically very difficult, which is why they're not being adopted. I stop there. Thank you, uh, Uri. Uh, Makane, are, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Well, good, I, I, good to I, meet you. Good to yes, meet you. Good to meet you. And hi, hi everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Well, let me let me say that the climate is changing, and so is climate diplomacy. Uh, global treaties may be failing, while unilateral actions are proving to be contentious, both within the climate and the trade regime. At the same time, countries need to be given the right and incentives to participate in the fight against climate change and to start curbing their emissions substantially. The EU's decision to introduce a CBAM and the new momentum around carbon pricing may be perfect uh, opportunity to revisit the ideas in the form of clubs. Indeed, uh, as an in inherently global phenomenon, climate change requires nations to cooperate. In my view, climate related trade measures seem to be the most promising instruments to disincentivize free riders, considering that the main free riding incentives that undermine the effectiveness of climate agreements are linked uh, to trade. And in this respect, the European CBAM uh, can play a positive role in, in deterring carbon competitiveness that European companies may suffer as a result of higher price on, on carbon. But there is a major concern with the EU uh, CBAM. Of all the choices made by the EU in designing its own CBAM, the one that is the most questionable is the decision to go in it alone. This choice is questionable from both a trade and environmental law perspective. In the trade regime, the legitimacy and legality of unilateral trade measures to protect the environment have been debated since the very first trade and environment conflicts. While unilateral acts are not prohibited per se, they can become contentious when they are associated with the imposition of values by one country on another as an expression of disproval of the latter's environmental behavior, and when they hide 
as Uri was mentioning, protectionist or discriminatory intent. This is generally the case when a unilateral trade measure is adopted without prior cooperation with a unilateral trade measure. Uh, sorry, when a unilateral trade measure is adopted without prior cooperation with the potentially affected uh, countries. The WTO applied body made this point very clear in its stream turtle report uh, in 1998. And the WTO applied body stressed the need for concerted and cooperative efforts. Such concerted and cooperative efforts are similarly required by most international environmental law instruments, in, including climate change instruments. Both the environmental and the climate regimes are built around the idea of cooperation. For instance, principle 12 of the Rio Declaration stressed that unilateral actions to deal with environmental challenges outside the jurisdiction of the importing country should be avoided. And principle 12 of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development uh, says further that environmental measures addressing transboundary or global environmental problems should as far as possible be based on an international consensus. Similarly, climate change instruments since the adoption of the Bali Action Plan in 2007 have been very clear in stressing the fundamental importance of long-term cooperative action and global cooperation. Questionable unilateralism aside, the EU CBAM represent a concrete attempt to reconceptualize climate action by proposing a different incentive uh, structure. Integrating trade and climate policies can potentially go a long way in addressing the free riding plague that affects the existing global climate uh, regime. However, rather than going in it alone, countries can find other like-minded countries and form coalitions and use these coalitions to redefine the, re the relationship between trade and, and climate goals. That was precisely the idea behind the launch of the structured discussions on trade and environment, environmental sustainability uh, in November 2020 by a group of WTO members, and including among others the EU, Australia, Canada, Japan, Mexico, Costa Rica, and, and, and Senegal. It was within these structured discussions, for instance, that the US advanced a proposal to amend the text of the WTO agreement on subsidies to punish those countries that do not uphold certain fundamental levels of environmental um, protection. Along the same lines, group of countries have advanced their environmental and climate objectives in free trade agreements and investment treaties, such as, for instance, the comprehensive agreement on investment uh, between the EU and, 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 and China. So we need to develop a shared understanding. And I think this is the major problem with the EU CBAM is that it's, it doesn't rest upon a shared understanding. We need to develop a shared understanding that could motivate a group of countries to gather around a CBAM proposal and form a climate coalition or club. And the climate re regime itself is familiar with the creation of groups and even subgroups of countries, whether we call them climate clubs, carbon clubs, carbon market clubs, club-like arrangements, climate mitigation clubs, it does not really matter. What matters is the existence of a cooperative agreement to govern a public good and provide appropriate incentives for its um, into penalties for, for non-members. This way, a climate club could combine trade instruments and climate policies, creating costs for non-members and thereby avoiding uh, free riding. So to conclude, if you allow me just to conclude, I think that what we, what we need to, 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 to push for is really a, a, a cooperation. Uh, and the seed of cooperation can be planted. And when we see some of the recent moves in the climate change regime, for instance, the very last um, report of the IPCC actually calls for CBM, but from an international cooperative approach. And we've been also seeing some NDCs like the one from Mexico that are calling for a global agreements on carbon uh, pricing. So I think the EU can play a leader in 
in fostering cooperation around such uh, approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Makane. Uh, would like to get to have a chance to have people argue with each other if we can. Uh, Reinhard, I think there are quite a few fans that are anxiously waiting to hear you. Well, I, I, I might have, thank you, and Andre, and thank you for inviting you. I might have to disappoint them since I work uh, in the last five years only on academic issues and non on industrial issues any longer. But I have prepared a short intervention on the compatibility of the Paris Agreement, uh, of CBAMs with the Paris Agreement. And I think that the CBAM proposal of the Commission, and therefore I have not uh, responded earlier, is not in line with the requirements of the Paris Agreement. And that leads me to some um, statements which I will give in a judgment-like response because we don't have much time. I would like to speak about differentiation, the carbon price in general, the EU's price in particular, and the oversight system, and conclude why I think the underlying problem of carbon leakage is the real problem. Differentiation, we already heard it, that uh, the Paris Agreement seems to violate the differentiation, and the CBAM proposal seems to violate the differentiation agreement uh, the differentiation agreement, uh, uh, the differentiation proposal of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I would like to ask one question. Given the fact that there is a symmetry in obligations under Paris between developed and developing countries, am I right to assume that under Paris, a developing country is allowed to produce a covered product, CBAM covered product? in a less climate-friendly way than in the EU. And if that is the case, then the CBAM is a punitive measure. I think in the explanations of the Commission on CBAMs, the Commission implicitly accepts that the CBAM proposal violates the differentiation requirement and suggests a targeted approach. I would argue this is an eyewash because the targeted approach is anyway um, in line with what the EU has to do under Paris. So they should apply a targeted approach, but independent of what they say on CBOPs. Secondly, the carbon price in general. We know that the CBOM is based on the idea that carbon should have a price, and it focuses then on EU carbon. Paris, on the other hand, says parties have a choice. The parties decide which commitments contribute best to their highest possible ambition in light of different national circumstances. And here the problem is Article 9 of the CBAM proposal. What is adjusted, what is not adjusted, what is compensated? And I think the, the, the proposal is far too strict with respect to non-price measures. If we only accept price measures, then we have a real problem. Well, I seem to have a problem in my... Uh... No, we hear you well. Okay. Um, so Article 9 is very strict. Non-price measures are not accepted. Now, I give you two examples. One might be a little bit more illusionary. If somebody plants 100 million trees, is that not a good proposal under uh, Paris, but not accepted with respect to sea bumps first? But the second may be more likely... A, a typical command and control legislation restricting CO2 emissions, the old way of regulating the environment, would not be accepted under Article 9. And I think here we have a real problem with the CBAM proposal. And the argument of which the Commission makes of administrative convenience is difficult to accept in view of the freedom of choice which the Paris Agreement gives to the parties. Now, the EU price in particular, suppose the, an, an exporting country adopts an ETS system, and then the market of this country will determine the price of this uh, for the certificates. If the price is lower than the EU's price, the importer will have to pay the difference. I ask myself why. If the country in question complies with its obligation under Paris, there is no climate reason for the EU to charge the EU's import price. And lastly, the oversight system. 
of the Paris Agreement. The CBAM proposal reflects a judgment by the Commission on the appropriateness and the sufficiency of the commitments by other parties. The Commission assumes that other parties are not doing enough to protect the climate and alleges non-compliance with Paris. And I think that this assumption stands in contrast with the oversight system of the Paris Agreement. Article 13 to 15 help parties to comply with their obligations in a non-intrusive, non-adversarial way. What the proposal does is that, what the Paris Agreement does is it looks at how can we help countries to improve their national determined contributions prospectively, and not how can we punish them with a border measure retrospectively because we think they haven't done enough. And here, I think there is a real conflict between the oversight system of the Paris Agreement and what the Commission has been proposing. And by imposing a penalty on climate laggards, the CBAM proposal, I think, contravenes the Paris approach to a facilitative and non-adversarial way to improve climate commitments of uh, uh, the parties. I come to my last point. What is the underlying problem? And the underlying problem, ladies and gentlemen, I think is the notion of carbon leakage. I accept that the EU is in a real dilemma. It has to take, even under Paris, very ambitious commitments. And therefore, it thinks it can justify its proposal with a kind of protection of the domestic industry. And what the proposal does is that it elevates the notion of carbon leakage to an overarching principle trumping all other legal obligation which the EU is supposed to comply with. And here, and here I differ from what Aaron has written and said, is that the notion of carbon leakage can only be applied within the context of the EU's international climate obligation. Only within this obligation, it is a climate justification. Outside of it, it's an economic, or should I say, a protectionist measure. And I would like to come back to what Antonia has said, because I agree with her with, in, a, in a lot of issues. I disagree with her in one, with one point, and maybe we can discuss that. And that is, we have to do something. You see, I agree, we have to do something. I also agree that we should have acceptable response measures, because we don't have what are acceptable response measures. But if you say we have to do something, then I would say, then everybody does whatever he or she wants. And that is dangerous. Because the, the fear I see with this proposal, and also now with the, with the amendments made in the European Parliament, that you should have enough time to discuss this, and maybe to see that you can agree on response measures by multilateral, bilateral, or plurilateral agreements. And then there is no need for a CEPA, because then everybody would probably do the response measures themselves. But if everybody allows unilateral action to be taken, then we have a real problem. And therefore, I think that is uh, difficult uh, from a point of view of Paris, although I have to accommodate all those which I have attacked now, um, that the European Union will not be held accountable for violating the Paris Agreement. It can defy the rule of international law with a proposal, but it will not be held accountable. The reason why I say that is we then transfer the whole exercise to the WTO. And then the whole exercise to the WTO. And there I, 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 I really think we have a problem because we will then have to decide within the context of Article 20, the chapeau of Article 20, whether the EU has taken into account the specific circumstances in the country concerned. And if I, have to, if I have to do that, then I will introduce a kind of discussion within the WTO dispute settlement on whether the country complies with its Paris obligation, yes or no. Because if the country does not comply, uh, complies with its Paris obligation, then there is then the measure will be considered arbitrary or unjustifiable. 
And there, I think we have a problem because we put something into the WTO, which the WTO is not fit to deal with. And therefore, I think we need to have response measures discussed in Paris and not in the WTO, so that we have some guidance for the WTO, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Thank you. I think, Reinhard, this is very interesting, but I, I think there's a few alarm bells running in some capitals right now. I guess Aaron, so. Aaron, I call upon you. Well, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot. Let me just say quickly that, uh, you know, I respect greatly Reinhardt's depth of expertise on WTO law and his uh, knowledge of how it applies to the Paris Agreement. But he and I, and you and I actually, Andre, have a, a different interpretation of what the Paris Agreement is. The bottom-up nature of that agreement, the, the uh, NDCs as the, the building blocks of the Paris Agreement, to me, are an indication that there is no assumption by any country that the actions of other countries are adequate. There is at no point in, in the, any of the mechanisms of the Paris Agreement or the text of the Paris Agreement, or in my opinion, the spirit of the Paris Agreement, an assumption that every country agrees that other countries that have complied with their NDCs are adequately addressing climate change. That is fundamentally absent in the Paris Agreement. And therefore, there should be no expectation that countries that are achieving their NDCs, that have stood up and made those pledges and are achieving them, um, are exempt from any sort of uh, trade-related measures by other countries that are trying to achieve ambition. I don't think that, uh, I, I disagree with that interpretation. And, and moreover, I, I would point out that the CBDR, the Common But Differentiated Responsibility and Respective Capabilities, does say that we need to uh, take account of uh, the, the capacities uh, and historical responsibilities that's absolutely true, and we need to take account of the difficulties faced by developing countries in achieving their climate objectives. But it also says developing countries must be ambitious and take leadership action on mitigating their own emissions. And I fail to see how that's possible if uh, those actions simply lead to leakage. So uh, we are somewhat in a... Uh back into the, uh, the issue of CBAM and, and border adjustment, some were falling between WTO and the FCCC, as I said. Makane? No, thank you. And I just wanted to jump back on what uh, Aaron said, and I, I think I, I agree with him. First, first of all, the, the legal value or legal nature of, of NDCs was never clearly determined. If we if we look at uh, previous COPs before before Paris, the old discussion around INDCs was always without prejudice of their of their legal nature or, or legal uh, value. But I think that uh, in both COPs, but also IPCC very recent report, it has been clearly said that um, the aggregate of NDCs will not allow us. To, to stay below the two degrees Celsius. Actually, by the end of the century, this is what the IPCC said, we, we will reach an increase of uh, 3.2 uh, degrees Celsius. So what does it mean? It means that what has been communicated is actually contrary to the Paris Agreement by most of the countries, because it doesn't allow to achieve one of the objective, which is to, 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 to limit the increase of the global temperature below two degrees. Celsius. So most of the NDCs that have been communicated are actually not in compliance with the Paris Agreement. But as Reynard was saying, Article 15 of the Paris Agreement is, is quite weak because the, the, the compliance mechanism is all based on facilitation, non-confrontation, uh, etc. So, so it means that we need to think about as a, as a measures uh, to actually uh, improve and measures uh, it should be should be should be contemplated there and and not necessarily seen as 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 incompatible with with the Paris agreement but of course the, the, the there's always a need to make sure that uh, this reflects the the, the 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 idea of cooperation under the Paris agreement and not unilateral action thank you uh, McConaughey. anyone else wants to react Reinhardt? Uh, I just wanted to say I don't disagree with Aaron that developing countries have to do something. But that doesn't answer my question. You see, 
I think what you do, Aaron, is you, you put the notion of carbon leakage to a kind of um, height, which I think the Paris Agreement doesn't allow for. And I have two questions for you. A, the Paris Agreement allows a country to produce covered products in a less friendly climate way, in a less climate friendly way, uh, does it or does it not? If it does, because the country complies with all the other provisions, then the EU has no reason to take action against that country. Secondly, developing countries have to do their, their uh, have to also contribute to the achievement of the Paris goals, in particular the, the temperature goals, and they have to do something. I don't disagree with that. But I say they have to do much less than the developed, developed countries. So if they have to do much less, then I consider what the developed country EU is doing against them is a punitive measure. And that goes contrary to what the oversight system is all about. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Well, look, let me, let me go to, uh, I have Antonia and then Uri and then Tomasz Głoskowski coming from the audience. So Antonia, you go first. But what I would also like to, it's my duty as, as, as chair to also bring you back to the discussion that is happening today, how this whole thing is going to influence uh, where the CBAM thing goes in the end. Go ahead, Antonia, please. So I, I think, you know, we're all talking about very legitimate issues. And I think, Reinhardt, you mentioned that there should be more time. And you're right, with all these proposals, we do need more time to discuss them. But we don't have time. And I think that's the problem. The time was 20 years ago. I grew up in Switzerland in the 1980s. And I remember global warming being a thing back then. And now I have a seven-year-old and nothing's changed except for the climate. So some of this seems, you know, it, there's a point where what we're seeing is unilateral action as we've been talking about that sometimes isn't the best response the best response would have been to come together and take the time and make these things 20 30 years ago now we're stuck with kind of scraps and trying to do the best we can in a very broken and imperfect situation with increasing political social and economic tensions that are being driven by climate change itself so the world around us is being shaped by that and i think that makes some of this seem like an intellectual exercise and i understand the importance from an industry standpoint but it, it seems like too little too late in some ways i'm very pessimistic <laughs> uri and then thomas Uh, what do you, you should unmute yourself, please. Well, first to say that I agree with uh, everything that Ryan had said. Um, and uh, I thought the point about uh, 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 regulatory measures or non price measures uh, being uh, ignored by the CBAM is a particularly important one. And of course, we agree that there is a major deviation here from the Paris Agreement. So uh, just want to underscore that. Uh, the second point I want to make uh, is uh, we put a lot of emphasis on developing countries, which I think is right, because uh, there's such a huge uh, uh, deviation. Uh, even if you forget Paris and everything else between the uh, emissions per capita or emissions as a share of GDP in uh, Germany or France uh, with uh, compared to India, for example, that it frankly seems uh, obscene uh, to even uh, imagine that you want to impose uh, a tax, taxes on Indian uh, exports uh, because they because of emissions, you know, ignoring uh, the consumption side, the enormous enormous uh, emissions per capita in Germany and France uh, compared to uh, India, um, and it's right. So we should be worried about developing countries, but you know, the other country you should worry about is the United States. Uh, 
Now, right now we have a sort of wishy-washy administration that is not taking a clear position and sort of wanted to sound good as Antonia uh, very well uh, explained. Uh, the next administration may be taking a very different view. The next administration, uh, certainly the next Congress could very well be a Republican Congress. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the US is also now a signatory to the Paris Agreement. And that means that the US also has a right to use different measures than the ETS uh, uh, to deal with carbon emissions and use regulatory measures, et cetera, et cetera. And so the next administration and the next Congress may take a much less sanguine view of uh, the carbon tax in the, uh, the, carbon, the CBAM in, in Europe uh, than does the sort of equivocal uh, position of the current of the current administration. Last point I want to make is uh, with regard to Antonia, we have to do something. I remind us of the Hippocratic oath: primum non nocere, first do no harm. And uh, uh, I am very very concerned that uh, that the CBM will undermine all prospects for the WTO retaining its value as a legal system uh, internationally. And then that will affect all of our, all of our uh, standard of living. And if we really want to do something unilaterally, then there are things we can do unilaterally that are very direct and very important, OK? Uh, outlawing the use of coal in the electricity grid and setting a clear timetable for that. Moving, there's a controversy about that, what it will do, moving to electric vehicles uh, in a faster time frame. There are all sorts of regulatory steps that can be taken that will not be discriminatory from an international point of view that can be fully consistent with WTO and, and actually very straightforward to implement if you are willing to accept the political price. And that's the problem with the CBA, is it's kind of a fudgy political compromise that's going to cause a lot more problems than it solves. Tomasz Lustowski. I'm again trying to bring it back. I think this is fascinating because I, 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 I want people to hear a little bit some of the thinking. I'm not sure that you're speaking for a particular entity organization or, or, or legal entity, but your, uh, your thinking is important. And I'm, I'm going to come back and see to what degree do you think all of you think that what you're saying here is really reflecting the society, broad society that will be interplaying in this. But first, Tomasz. If you want to introduce yourself briefly and, and go ahead, please. Yes, hi, my name is Thomas Wostowski. I'm a trader and a regulatory lawyer. I work mostly with the fertilizer industry. Uh, two points. One is I wanted to go back to the beginning of this conversation, uh, the one we had uh, where we discussed the results of the envy vote, uh, because I noticed that most of the people were very choosing their words very carefully. So uh, I'm not going to do that. And I'm just going to say what I he I'm hearing most of the people are saying which is that the vote in envy was an outrage, quite frankly, from the industry perspective. And the reason for that, the reason why I say it's an outrage, is because none of the substantive issues got resolved. None of the issues got resolved. So every single sort of practical competitive issue that was raised as a problem to be solved was ignored. On, and on top of that, the ambition was very uh, um, sort of strengthened. New sectors were added in, new emissions were added in, uh, and the withdrawal of free allowance was, was accelerated. So basically none of the concerns that were raised by the industry was addressed, and the ambition was very seriously uh, increased. And wh why is that important? It's important because I think we discussed this numerous times previously, you know, there are discussions among industry as well about the role of the Envy Committee, about the strength of the Envy Committee in the Parliament, and about the lack of any sort of reasonable engagement with the industry in the Envy Committee in the Parliament. And I think this will have political repercussions down the road, again, because it's a committee that's too powerful and too 
reluctant to hear the industry's voice uh, uh, for the things to continue the way they're continuing. So, and that issue is going to have a continuation. I can promise you, maybe not soon, but there will be a continuation of that development. Now, one more point I wanted to make, and this is um, uh, in response to something that Dr. Quick said, uh, and that's about carbon leakage. And I think we've discussed this here as well, which is, I think it will prove in the future to have been a fatal mistake of CBAM to focus on carbon leakage as its driving idea. What it should have been built on is the uh, idea that we are trying to help or pressure or convince third countries to lower their emissions and that we're trying to limit our own import emissions. We should have abandoned the carbon leakage argument because number one, it's protectionist and number two, it's going to lead to WTO problems and number three, it leads to the whole free allowances, alternative or complementary system, a political problem, which is gonna continue and jeopardize CBAM as it comes to a fruition, because let's keep in mind, this is not over. There is a parliamentary vote, there is a plenary vote, and then there is the trial. Uh, so the, the, the more ambitious CBAM becomes, the more voices will be raised about whether CBAM is actually worth the effort. Thank you. Very well. Uh, I'm trying to look for other intervener. Uh, Aaron, I think there were some questions from from Reinhardt. Uh, there was a direct question, sure. And then the, the, the premise of the question, I'm sorry, you, you'll hear a dog uh, objecting in the background. Uh, she doesn't <laughs> become a very good speaker. She's uh, the peanut gallery. The, the direct question was, does the Paris Agreement allow developing countries to produce at a different standard than uh, developed countries like the EU? And in which case, uh, isn't uh, premising imports from the EU uh, or to the EU from those countries, a contravention of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement doesn't say one way or the other what countries are allowed to do, what what the kinds of standards they're allowed to uh, produce to. That's not the point of the Paris Agreement. <coughs> um, and and it, I I would put this in the context of thinking about uh, the CBAM as a as a standard. You know, we, we're, you're applying a standard at the border, which says, if you meet these standards, uh, and we're talking about PPM based standards here, standards based on how a good is produced, uh, we'll, we'll import your goods. Um, and the, the idea that that is an illegitimate um, exercise of unilateral authority by a country was put to bed by the shrimp turtle uh, uh, ruling of the WTO. We know that countries have a right under legitimately circumscribed circumstances and, and to dictate how a good was produced if they are going to import it. So the EU is not, in my opinion, dictating to anybody what they have to do or how they should do, um, but they are exercising their legitimate right to say that uh, if if countries choose to produce goods on a high carbon way, they will be restricted from entry into the EU. Good. Seems to me fairly straightforward. Wow. And to come back to it, the Paris Agreement does not actually dictate or, or allow or disallow varied types of production in other countries. Well, listen. Let me uh, <clears throat> let me uh, let me take a last round, starting with Reinhardt and, and going around the, the table uh, on the screen. Unfortunately, it's not a real table. Uh, what? Uh, how do you think the world sees this? I mean, you obviously have expressed your opinions. You have your thinkers, your people that have been involved in this debate. But what's your sense? I mean, where is this going to land? I mean, this is going to land. There will be a landing in the EU. Some kind of legislation is inconceivable at this time that there will be no legislation on CBAM. It's just been too many eggs in this basket and too many, too many political careers being forwarded. Uh, <clears throat> It'd be interesting to hear your last round, but before I go to the last round, I, need, I think some, uh, okay, the panelists were raised there, aren't I? I thought it was somebody else. So let me start with Reinhardt and then go to Uri, Antonia, and then walk my, say, myself back. So uh, Reinhardt, you go first. I think I can respond to that when we do the final round. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, let's start with the final round because I think we've got like seven minutes left. So let's, let's go for the final round, Reinhardt. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think the, I mean, I have my principal thinking and 
academic writing is that the CBAMs are WTO incompatible. The CBAM proposal is WTO incompatible and is Paris incompatible. But I would argue that CBAMs are here to stay. So the less, the more time the proposal has once it is, it, it becomes legislation to allow the commission to negotiate with the countries concerned, the better. But what I see is that if we follow Aaron's arguments, then we have really an opening of everybody can do whatever he or she wants. And given the fact that the WTO dispute settlement system is not working that well right now, I'm not concerned about an eventual WTO case. I'm concerned about a myriad of CBAM legislations distinguishing from other CBAM legislation and thereby introducing to the industry new standards and different standards for every country to which they want to export. And if I take Uri's argument, just assume that India were to propose a CBAM on per capita CO2 emissions, how would we react? Uh, and therefore, I think what we need, really need, and, and that's the reason why I insist on, we can only solve this through negotiations. And I hope that the commission, which I think has called the evil spirits with its proposal, is able to overcome this. And when we speak about circumvention, and when we speak about reshuffling, resource shuffling, and all the other things, which, and, and when we in particular speak about leveling the playing field, I get a cold shiver over my shoulder. And this situation reminds me of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's sorcerer apprentice. You remember he also called evil spirits who helped him. And then he couldn't get rid of him. And what he said in the end, and I hope that will also be true for the European Union. I have need of thee, my Lord, from the spirits that I called for, deliver me. Thank you. Well, <laughs> okay. I will react to this at the end. Uri and then Makane and Antonia. All right. Uh, look, first of all, again, agree with Reinhardt. Um, uh, you know, when I was at the World Bank many years, I was in charge of forecasting at the World Bank. I never lost the habit, unfortunately, of trying to forecast. Uh, you ask, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, I think in the end, because the CBAM proposal is so fundamentally flawed and so fundamentally opposite to other uh, objectives and commitments of the EU, I'm referring to the Paris Agreement and to the World Trade Organization, of which the EU is uh, the most important single supporter today, together with China. Uh, uh, because it is opposite uh, to those interests, uh, in the end, uh, 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 because it is opposite to those interests, and because there will be huge, as there is, resistance on the part of the domestic industry in the European Union to the phase out of, of allowances, which is another way of saying uh, opposition to the carbon tax uh, uh, of these industries and of any other industry that is where the, the carbon tax is contemplated because of the opposition of these two huge, very important constituencies, and eventually the opposition of the United States, uh, India, and China, to quote three. Um, in the end, the CBAM uh, 
may be implemented because the bureaucratic impetus is so important now in the US, in the EU, uh, but it will be implemented in a minimalist and, and gradual fashion, number one. And because it doesn't add up to very much, because when you calculate the, even the EU's own calculation of the revenues is in a handful, as I recall, of a billion, of a billion euros, it's, it's actually, you know, much ado about nothing uh, in the end. And it will create a lot of friction. And one way or another, it will be negotiated away, very likely be negotiated away. It may be negotiated, it may simply go under the radar screen and stay there as a very low uh, tax, or it will be negotiated away as part of some kind of big bilateral uh, kerfuffle between, say, the European Union and the United States at some point. That's one scenario, but it also could be uh, involving other countries. That's my forecast. Okay, let's go down uh, the list, uh, Makade. Yes, thanks. I, my, my first one is that I, 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 I think it's very hard to to be that sure about incompatibility or compatibility uh, between uh, the CBAM and the Paris Agreement on one hand and the CBAM and WTO law on, on the other end. I, I, I think that it's all, a, it all a matter of design of a, of a trade measure. It's all a matter also of the process uh, behind a, a trade measure. WTO case law uh, is quite differential to, to trade restrictive measures that are based on, on international norms or, or, or cooperative uh, process. Why I'm saying that it's very hard to say that CBAM is contrary um, to the Paris Agreement is that once again, if we look at the very recent report of the Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change, it mentions um, various trade uh, related mitigation measures and, and among them uh, carbon uh, border adjustments. So the IPCC itself is not excluding uh, the possibility to have recourse to that. So, so incompati incompatibility in my view would depend really on the design uh, of, of, of a CBAM. Now, I, I think we, we need sometimes, and I don't think I, I heard it today during the discussion, we did not mention at all Article 6 of the Paris Agreement uh, which is actually giving freedom or, or, or a right to parties to the Paris Agreement to engage in, in voluntary uh, cooperation to, to actually achieve higher, higher mitigation uh, ambitions or, or higher adaptation ambitions. And, and I think that the pass of Article 6 could allow to a certain extent uh, measures like CBAM but once again, I, I think that it has to be based on a cooperative uh, process. The, the Paris Agreement, like the UNFCCC, are very clear on the fact that climate change is a common concern of humankind. So, so the cooperative, uh, the cooperative uh, basis of all these measures is, is fundamental. And we, we've been seeing some very good initiatives that can actually also inspire the, the, the EU in 2020, for instance, Switzerland and Peru uh, concluded a carbon offsetting uh, agreement. And, and from what I heard uh, last year, the, the US and the EU announced that they, they would negotiate the world first carbon-based sectoral arrangement on steel and, and aluminum trade by 2024. I think that these are bilateral initiatives that are in line with the Paris Agreement and if CBAM could actually uh, engage, involve at least another country or two or three other countries, it would get much more legitimacy and, 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 and be much more compatible uh, without that with the, with the Paris Agreement in particular at Article 6. Thank you. Thank you, Matane. Uh, Antonia, you have the last word. Um, well, I will try to be very brief because I know we're a little over time. Um, so as we kind of already have talked about, right, CBAM can only be WTO compatible if there are comparable internal measures. And so this idea of a proliferation of CBAMs, as broken as the WTO dispute settlement system is, 
if you don't have an internal mechanism of some sort, it will get challenged and it will get overturned. So I think that's less of a concern. And it took the EU so long to get a working ETS, right? Decades. It's not super easy to get some sort of internal measure. Um, but I think as Ori mentioned, the US particularly, we are really up in the air when it comes to climate change. And it is that vagaries of one Congress, one president, you know, withdraw from the Paris Agreement, come back in, withdraw, who knows what happens. And so I think what CBAM represents represents is the first steps taken to move away from a world where the U.S. is dominant. And I think that that is symbolically significant that the EU said, you know what, screw you, U.S., we're not going to wait for you to actually do something. We're going to go ahead and move. And I think that that itself has some significance and may bring other countries into the fold at some point. Um, but realistically, CBAM itself, it isn't it's neither that fantastic for climate change, right? Nor is it great for industry. So in a way it kind of doesn't do that much to benefit anyone, whether it's climate activists or industry, but it does mark a step in saying, we can't just wait for the United States. And I think that is a profoundly important step. And yes, the US needs to be doing things with climate change, but with climate change being the concern that it is, we can't just wait forever. Okay, so we've heard it all. We heard the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. We've heard a, a number of other things. Now, any of my colleagues would like to, to, to jump in with last words, very quick words of wisdom, because you, as Antonia said, it's been a fascinating discussion, and, and I'm proud that the RCSP has such a diversity of views, uh, interesting views. Uh, Aaron, I think you're, you're, you're chomping out a bit. Go ahead. I always am, but you know, I speak too much. Just r really quickly, right? If, if we're thinking about uh, the, the idea that there are many things that we can do that are WTO compatible uh, outside of a CBAM, that's not true in the case of heavy industry. We're talking about 20 to 30% of emissions in very hard to abate sectors. The CBAM is an instrument specifically designed to address that. And it's going to be a problem, not just in the EU, but in any country that seeks to achieve climate ambition and try to get to net zero. It's not just the EU, Canada's doing it, there are other, UK is considering it. So the, the CBAM, as imperfect as it is, and I'm the first one to say, this is an imperfect, possibly ineffective, possibly trade illegal instrument, is probably necessary. And it comes back, as McCann said, to the issue of design. And this brings us back to the topic of today's uh, uh, webinar, how are you going to design the features to prevent issues like circumvention? And I think the discussion was too rich to summarize, but uh, let's bring it back there. Anyone else that would like to jump in and this final word of wisdom? Nada? Okay. Well, no. Okay. Well, listen, thank you very much for all of you. I think that I think in the middle of people talking about uh, compromise amendments, number 101 and 1.1 and 1.2, and I mean, this is driving me crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not into that business anymore, but many people are in that business. Uh, but in the middle of this whole madness is also it's always good to have a, a discussion of principle, however esoteric it may sound to many. How many, how, no matter how esoteric it may sound to many, because we do still hope, we still hope that uh, these ideas, this principle, this this yeah, this, this deep discussion will influence some people in their views. To one degree, again, this is going to be reflected in position on the current or future U.S. administration. I mean, if you know, once you start introducing uh, chemicals into this, this is going to be a lot of fun in in Houston. Uh, and how you, you know how it's going to be received in Delhi when it really happens, and how it's going to be received in, in, in Beijing and in other places. It's something that will be seen, but we will make this available. We hope people listen to it and draw their own conclusion. We are going now, I'm going now, not next week, but the week after, to a session of the subsidiary bodies in Bonn and then to the Shalva Sheikh pop in, uh, in November. Uh, some of this issue may or may not appear on the agenda or may be brought up or not be brought up. But it'd be interesting to see history will be written the way it is written. But we're sure to call back on you at some point. It's like those people that predict the World Cup and then after that are called back and say, did you guys get it right? 
So thank you very much, all of you. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I hope you found it also interesting and useful and hope to see you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.